The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so welcome back, everybody, to AO3. Um, so before we start the lecture today, we will uh, give you, a, as usual, a short review on what we have learned and, uh, and also um, an introduction about what we are going to learn today. Um, so last lecture, we were discussing an interesting phenomenon, which is a uh, uh, film uh, interference pattern. As you can see from this slide, uh, we were wondering why the uh, soap bubbles are colorful. And uh, in the end of the class, we actually uh, recognize that the reason why the soap bubbles are colorful is because of the interference phenomena uh, between uh, 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 the refracted light on the, the bubble. One, one, pass, one possible pass is that the light goes into the, uh, got refracted directly from, uh, from the surface of the, the soap film. The other possible optical uh, pass uh, is uh, uh, to uh, get refracted by the inner uh, surface of the, the film. Therefore, the interference between these two paths actually created a colorful pattern on the, uh, on the, on the, on the bubble. So um, we also learned how, about how thick is the uh, soft uh, film. And I think uh, just a quick reminder Actually, we concluded that uh, in order to see a colorful uh, uh, pattern, uh, the, the thickness of the wall, or say the, the film, uh, should be uh, something like in the order of 100 narrow meter. So that's actually pretty remarkable because that's already in the order of the size of the of a virus. Okay, so that's actually really, really cool. Um, so what are we going to do today? What we are going to do today is to continue the discussion of all kinds of different uh, phenomena which can be explained by interference. Uh, we will learn interference phenomena uh, with a double slit experiment and uh, using, uh, for example, laser or uh, 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 water, uh, which uh, I have a water tank here, which I will show you the interference pattern. And also the second thing we are going to learn today is how does a phase, laser, uh, phase the, uh, radar actually works, okay? So by, by the end of uh, the uh, lecture today, you should able, be able to, uh, to learn why we actually uh, construct the, the radar in that way and uh, how to actually uh, um, uh, focus on the, uh, the electromagnetic wave toward one specific direction. So that's actually what we are going to learn today. The third uh, goal is that we are going to make a connection to uh, quantum uh, mechanics uh, from the lecture today. All right, so uh, let's immediately get started. So before we start the discussion of uh, uh, double slit uh, experiment, I would like to remind everybody about Huygens' principle, which you may already learned it from AO2 or uh, in the high school days. So what is actually this principle? So this principle is saying that if I take a look at all the points, okay, uh, in the wave front, okay, basically you can treat all those points on the wave front as a point source. And this point source is actually a point source of uh, a spherical wave and that it's emitted uh, from uh, all the points on the wave front. So you can see from this uh, slide, basically uh, you, if we choose to focus on the yellow point uh, on the uh, wave front, you can see that from each yellow point, you can actually treat that as a spherical uh, wave uh, point source. And then uh, what you will actually need to do in order to calculate what would be the total of uh, electric field, for example, is to add up all those uh, contributions from each point, and then you will be able to actually explain uh, the interference pattern which we see uh, in uh, the experiment. Uh, you may wonder where is this 
Huygens principle coming from. And although we are not going to derive that uh, directly uh, in the lecture today, but I can actually safely tell you that it actually uh, can be derived by, from Maxwell's equation. Okay, I, I will link some document which actually shows the proof of the uh, principle uh, on the website uh, for your uh, uh, reference. The other thing which you may or you may not know is that we are really lucky so that we can use high, uh, 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 this uh, 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 Huygens principle in our universe. Why is that? Because if you look at the mathematical proof of this principle, uh, it is because the number of dimension, number of spatial dimension is odd, which is three in, in our universe, or in my universe also is yours, okay? <laughs> Happen to be yours as well. Um, such that the Huygens principle actually works. On the other hand, if the number of dimension is even, there's no Huygens principle, actually. So uh, that's pretty interesting, and we are really lucky that it actually works in our universe. Uh, but I will not go into detail uh, in L3. Um, so let's get started with a concrete example which we would like to further investigate uh, to understand the interference phenomena and also prepare ourselves to the understanding of the design of the ray radar, okay, for example. All right. So suppose I have an experimental setup here, uh, which uh, contain a wall, where on the wall there are two slits, uh, A and B. The upper one is A, and lower one is B, as designed here. And uh, from the left hand side, there is an insert uh, uh, plane wave uh, uh, with a wavelength uh, lambda, which is shown here. And this plane wave, uh, plane electromagnetic wave, or can be a water wave, etc., is actually approaching the, the wall with these two slits there. And we were wondering what would be uh, the resulting pattern on a screen. Uh, this screen is actually uh, uh, pretty far away from the experimental setup, the wall on the left hand side. How far is that? The distance between the, the screen, which shows the, the resulting interference pattern, and the, the wall is actually uh, uh, defined, uh, is actually given here, is actually called L, capital L. And the, in, the, in this experimental setup, L is actually pretty, pretty large, and it's much, much larger than the D, where D, small d, is the distance between the two slits. Okay? So, our job now is to understand what will be, uh, and to, to predict what is going to be the interference pattern coming from the, uh, the electromagnetic wave which pass through uh, point A and point B, okay? And uh, what is going to happen, uh, uh, or say, what will be the result which we will observe on the, on the screen, okay? So the first thing which we can do is that, okay, we can now assign an observer uh, which is called P, one of the uh, in, uh, point of interest on the screen, which is located here, okay? And we can link, or say, the connect uh, the point A, which is location of the first lead, and the location of the second lead, uh, uh, which is called B. Uh, we can link those uh, points together by a line, and that is actually denoted by AP and the BP, these two lines. Since we are talking about L, which is actually very, very large, okay, I assume that the distance, the length scale of the distance between the wall and the screen is much, much larger than the length scale of the distance between the two slits, which is D. Therefore, I, would, I can safely assume that AP and the BP are almost parallel to each other, right? And I can also uh, 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 try to express the location of the P point by using the angle between BP and uh, uh, the horizontal direction, okay? And the horizontal direction is actually uh, showing us the dashed line here. And the angle between BP and the horizontal direction is called theta here. Okay, so since AP and the BP are almost parallel to each other, okay, I can now 
calculate what will be the optical pass lens difference between AP and the BP, right? So in order to actually uh, calculate the phase difference between the, the, the uh, electromagnetic wave coming from uh, sleep A compared to sleep B, I need to calculate, again, like what we did last time, optical pass lens difference. Okay, in this case, I can call uh, the distance between A and P R A, and I can also call uh, the distance between uh, B and P R R B. Then uh, the optical pass lens difference is uh, called uh, R B minus R A, and we can actually calculate that because we have already uh, uh, given you the angle between BP and the horizontal direction, and the basically we can co safely conclude that, okay, the, the pass lens difference is actually this line here. Therefore, I can actually uh, calculate and uh, get the optical pass lens difference, the difference between RB and the RA to be D sine theta. Okay, once we have that, it's actually pretty straightforward to calculate what would be the phase difference. The phase difference between uh, the first, uh, uh, between the field from coming from uh, sleep A, which I would call it uh, EA here, and uh, the field coming from uh, 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 the sleep, number, uh, sleep B, which I would call it EB here. The phase difference, uh, as we actually did, defined uh, last time to be delta. Delta can be calculated by uh, the optical pass lens difference, d sine theta, right? Divided by lambda, which is actually telling you how many uh, periods have passed, okay, when uh, the, uh, the, uh, the light have to uh, actually overcome this, or say uh, have to pass through this uh, optical pass lens difference. And of course, this need to be multiplied by two pi, right, in order to translate to, uh, from a number of period to a phase difference. Therefore, you get uh, the phase difference between a p and a b p to be delta equal to d sine theta divided by lambda times two pi. Okay, so you can see that all those uh, calculations are pretty straightforward. Maybe you have already seen that before uh, in, in an earlier class. Uh, but I, what I want to say is that it is actually because of Huygens' principle such that you can expect something which will show up at point P, right? If you, have, you, if you don't have Huygens' principle, what is going to happen? What is going to happen is that the light passing through this lead will just go straight and they will never overlap each other, okay? So that's actually why, uh, because of the Huygens principle, all the point uh, source uh, are treated as a, uh, all the points uh, on the wave front are treated as a point source of uh, a sp spherical wave, okay? So that is actually why you can expect that something will hit the, the, uh, the, the P point, which is because in this case we have two points, uh, two uh, point source, and uh, it, they are emitting uh, spherical uh, uh, waves coming from these two uh, points. Okay, so it is really because of Huygens' principle, which applies here, such that we can see the um, uh, 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 we can actually see the uh, observe the phenomena at the p, and now we have managed to calculate the phase difference, which is uh, delta phi and t here. So. What the next question is, what will be the intensity? Since we have already calculated the uh, phase uh, uh, difference delta, what will be the in intensity observed at P? So for that, we have already uh, prepared ourselves from the last few lectures. So now we can actually calculate what will be the total E. The total E will be equal to EA plus EB. And here I'm going to use complex notation uh, just for simplicity. 
And basically, you can uh, rewrite EA and the EB as E0 exponential i omega t minus k uh, times ra plus e0 exponential i omega t minus k rb. The first uh, term is actually telling you the contribution from the uh, first lead, lead, uh, lead a. And the second term is actually telling you the contribution from uh, coming from the uh, B. In this setup, I'm telling you that I have the prime wave uh, coming from the left hand side of the experiment and uh, actually hitting the wall. And you can see that from the drawing, actually the wave front is actually uh, 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 actually telling you that the um, the direction of the electric field is actually uh, uh, in the uh, z direction in my uh, coordinate system uh, shown uh, on the board. So basically, the, the z direction is actually pointing you to, to you guys. And uh, that means uh, the electric field is actually oscillating in this direction. Okay? So therefore, I have to be careful. Those are uh, vectors. So therefore, I need to give uh, uh, the direction. And in this case, it's actually the z direction. And also, you can see that the amplitude is actually denoted by uh, E0 because uh, both, I would assume that both slits have uh, 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 the same uh, finite uh, width. Uh, for, for the moment, I ignore the width of the slit. And also, they are coming from the same uh, prime wave. There are, therefore, the amplitude is all uh, denoted by E0. Okay. So now, I have the expression here. And I can now go ahead and simplify this expression and rewrite that in, in this form. So I can now uh, extract the E0, and also I extract the common factors here, which is actually the exponential i omega uh, t uh, and uh, also uh, minus k uh, ra. Uh, I can actually factorize uh, some, some, some part of the exponential function out. So, so the, the choice I made is so that I, I actually can factorize out exponential i omega t minus k times r. Basically, I take this out, then I get this uh, uh, term shown here. Omega t minus k r a. I take this out. Then basically, what you are going to get inside will be 1 plus exponential minus i delta, actually. OK, why, why is that uh, delta? Because uh, once you factorize out or take out uh, exponential i omega t minus k r a, basically you are left with uh, something proportional to exponential i minus k r, uh, r b minus r a, right? And that is actually the optical path length difference here. And also, of course, you can always rewrite um, uh, lambda, uh, lambda uh, over 2 pi. Right? Basically, you can actually uh, 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 rewrite this to be uh, k times d times theta. Right? So therefore, uh, you can actually uh, immediately identify that the second term uh, 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 is, to, uh, is actually exponential minus i delta. OK? Any questions here? OK? Because sine theta, uh, sine, d sine theta is actually just rb minus ra. Therefore, I can safely replace uh, that by delta here. OK? All right. So it's, since everybody's on the same page, I can now, again, factorize out not only the omega t minus k r a term, but I can actually uh, do a trick to factorize out also exponential minus i delta divided by 2 out. And basically, what I'm going to get is exponential i delta over 2 plus exponential minus i delta over 2. The reason why I'm doing this is because huh, now I, I have this term identified. And this is actually just 2 times cosine delta divided by 2, right? OK. So now I'm really pretty close to the uh, intensity. So what would be the intensity uh, coming out of this uh, electric field? Uh, that is actually going to be uh, 
average intensity is, uh, as we discussed last time in the lecture, the average intensity is proportional to the uh, uh, square of an uh, e-vector, right? In the complex notation, how do we evaluate uh, uh, the absolute value of e uh, vector square? In the complex notation, basically, you get basically e times e star, right? Where e is actually the, the amplitude, uh, which is the, the size of the, uh, the e vector, okay, the magnitude of the e vector. Then basically, you will see that this will be proportional to cosine squared delta divided by 2, right? Because uh, you can see that if I calculate e, e star, then the, uh, all the terms related to uh, uh, exponential i something actually got canceled, right? So therefore, you can see that huh, very, very quickly, we can show that the intensity will be proportional to uh, cosine square delta divided by two, where delta is, the, uh, uh, is the, the phase difference between the first pass and the second pass, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so we can see that the intensity is actually changing really rapidly and uh, uh, as a function of delta, right? So when I have a situation where delta is equal to zero, okay? That's actually uh, uh, post a bit, and uh, stop here a bit and uh, enjoy what we have actually learned from here, all right? So if you have delta equal to zero, what does that mean? That means there's no uh, phase difference between the first and second electric field. Therefore, when you add them together, just a reminder about the notation we were using before. So if you draw the vector in a complex plane, what, is, what you are actually doing is that you are actually adding EA and the EB together in the most efficient way, right? Because the delta is equal to zero, the phase difference is equal to zero, therefore you are actually adding them in a straight line, okay? So that actually will give you the maximum intensity because when delta is equal to zero, cosine zero is one, right? Therefore, you are reaching the maxima in the intensity. So now I can always increase my delta until a, a number which is actually pi. What is going to happen is that if I still use the notation which I was using for the complex plane, what it does is that, huh, now I am actually completely canceling the electric field because the phase difference now is pi, right? So therefore, in the complex plane, you are adding uh, the two vectors in ways such that they completely cancel each other. The magnitude of the, the two vectors are the same, right? What's shown here, which is actually E0, right? Therefore, what you're going to get, as you expect, is going to be zero because they completely cancel. Okay, you, you can also see that from this formula we derived here, when delta is equal to pi, then it's actually cosine pi over two, then you get intensity equal to zero. Okay, everybody accept this? All right, now I can uh, uh, still continue and increase the delta, for example, until delta is two equal to two pi, then you are getting this again. Basically, you have Ea, and the EB, again, line up each other. And uh, the difference is that this EB actually rotated uh, maybe uh, uh, 360 uh, degree. And uh, basically, you will see that, again, the intensity become the maxima again, OK? So that is actually uh, how we can actually understand uh, this uh, result. And uh, of course, you can also uh, go ahead and uh, plot uh, or simulate this result in the computer and uh, really draw the uh, amplitude, uh, uh, sorry, really draw, draw the intensity as a function of uh, angle here, uh, or say uh, the delta here. As you can see from here that uh, the intensity is actually reaching the maximum 
in the, in the, uh, uh, in the center. Why is that? In the center, okay, if I, I have an a, a observer here in the center, what is going to happen is that the pass lens, optical pass lens between a, a P prime and the B P prime is going to be the same by symmetry, right? Because it's actually in the absolute center. Therefore, you will expect that a delta is actually equal to zero. Okay, so that is actually why you see the maxima there. And if you start to move away from there, you will see that the delta start to increase. And uh, at some point, you reach a minima, which you can see that uh, uh, on, on, on the plot. Uh, and uh, that is actually because now, the, due to the increasing uh, optical pass lens difference and the phase difference, the two electric field is starting to cancel each other which actually produce the black pattern there. And finally, after it passed delta equal to pi, okay, then, start, then these two electric fields start to work together again. All right, they're collaborating again, and then you can see that again, you would get another maxima uh, afterward, okay? And uh, here, you, you can see that this is actually my calculation, and uh, of course, I can do a, a demonstration uh, to you to really show that this is actually what we are going to see uh, uh, from, based on uh, uh, the, experiment, uh, the demonstration we are going to show here. So now I'm going to uh, turn the light off. And here I have a device which actually contains a water tank. And uh, I need to actually turn this thing up. On the uh, underwater tank, I have two vibrators, which is actually acting as a uh, uh, point source. So basically, those are vibrator are vibrating up and down to create uh, 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 waves in, uh, in this tank. Okay? So basically, you can see that, huh, really, you have two point-like source, and uh, uh, you can see a uh, spherical wave is actually really generated uh, and uh, actually propagating uh, away from the point source, okay? And uh, what I can do now, uh, you can see that this picture is really dynamic, right? Because uh, you can see that wave front is actually moving as a function of time. So what I'm going to do is to really uh, uh, change the frequency of the light, which is actually shining on this uh, uh, water so that you can actually see the, the fixed pattern here. And uh, now I am going to change the light uh, frequency. You can see now I only shine the, the water tank at the specific time, which match the speed of the propagation of the water wave. And you can see that how I actually managed to freeze the wave front. You see? OK, so you can see now, really, you can see uh, uh, the uh, coming from the source, there are uh, circular, circular uh, uh, wave front, which is actually mimicking, mimicking the, the result from Huygens' principle. And you can see that there are complicated uh, interference pattern uh, uh, forming. Uh, you can see that uh, at some point, they have constructive interference. If you focus on the, the central part, you can see that the maxima is actually reached there. On the other hand, if you move away, a little bit away from the center, you can see that uh, really the intensity drop. And uh, at some point, you, you will also see that, okay, again, uh, I am changing the position such that the phase difference between the, uh, the contribution from source A and the B uh, is actually equal to two pi. In that case, you will be able to see that uh, 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 the, the maxima, uh, another maxima is actually created again. So now we can actually also show you that uh, uh, that uh, effect of based on uh, this uh, Morius uh, pattern. Uh, let's actually take a look at the projector here. So if I look at on, on the uh, individual uh, uh, individual uh, slide which I have here. 
Okay, you can see that those are actually like a point-like source and uh, it's creating a circular pattern. And now I can actually overlap these two patterns together. And you can see that when I have uh, these two, uh, the center of the two uh, 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 circles are pretty close to each other, you can see that really you have very small d. In this case, you have very uh, small distance between uh, source number one and number two. Then basically, based on our uh, 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 expression, so you can see that delta is equal to d sine theta uh, uh, divided by lambda times two pi, right? And uh, you can actually calculate sine theta will be equal to delta divided by k times d, okay? When uh, delta is equal to two pi, this will, uh, uh, is equal to pi, sorry. When delta is equal to pi, that is going to give you a minima, okay? Where is actually also shown here, the minima is shown as the black pattern here, okay? You can see from, from here. So what this actually formula is showing you that when I have d, which is very small, what is going to happen is that I'm going to get uh, sine theta to be very large, right? When d is very, actually very small. And that can be shown here. When I have d, which is the distance between the center of the, these two point source, are very uh, small, you can see that uh, the place you get the minima is really far away from the center, which is actually here which is actually here, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is to increase the distance between these two sources. According to our prediction, what is going to happen is that the, the central maxima will decrease. The position where you get a minima will be moving closer to the center, right? According to that formula, because it's proportional to one over d, and we can do this uh, really carefully to see if I can success, succeed. And you can see that really, when I am moving these two slides away from each other, you can see that the pattern is changing, right? And the cent center uh, maxima, or say uh, this uh, uh, Gaussian-like uh, curve there, become me narrower and narrower, okay? So that is actually what we can actually learn from here. And our uh, calculation really works very well here. Very good. So uh, do we have any questions regarding the demonstration we have here? Okay. So all those things seems to be uh, pretty straightforward to you. And uh, what we, ac we are actually uh, now is in a position where we can actually uh, discuss how we actually can uh, understand uh, uh, the, the radar, which is uh, how, how actually radar works. So here is actually how radar works. Suppose you have some unknown uh, object, which is uh, like an airplane, okay? And you, uh, you would like to know where is this object. What you do, actually, is to shoot whatever radio waves toward some direction and see if there is something coming back, right? Then you know there's something on the sky because you can detect the refractive wave, right? So, so we shoot this uh, uh, airplane and the something is going to come back and now you can say, okay, at that direction I have something coming back. That means there's something there, and I can also measure the time it takes uh, for, for, for the wave to come back, then I know where is actually that object, right? So that's actually a pretty a straightforward uh, thing to do. However, there's one difficulty. So this is actually the, uh, the radiation pattern of uh, oscillating uh, dipole, which we actually learned before. So the problem is that, okay, what we really need is electromagnetic wave, which is actually uh, very, very narrow in angle and the pointing to some specific direction. And then I would like to see if I can get some 
uh, refractive wave uh, coming from that direction, okay? The problem is that, look, if I isolate some charge up and down, the radiation I'm getting is really, really broad, right? So it's going to work all kinds of different direction. So if you use this to detect things, you are, you are always going to get something uh, coming back because it's actually shooting the electromagnetic wave into a direction. And uh, you are not sure anymore uh, where is actually this object you are trying to detect. Okay, so that's, a, that's actually apparently a problem. And uh, what we can actually do is to make use of the interference uh, phenomena, which we uh, can actually learn from here, to actually try to uh, make sure that the electromagnetic wave is actually pointing to some specific direction we want. We want. So let's actually go ahead and consider a three sleep experiment. I have this uh, uh, setup uh, changed. Originally, I have two slits. And now I am drilling three holes on the, on the wall. And again, I have the distance between the slits uh, to be d. And I call this uh, slit number one, two, and the three. And uh, we were wondering what would be the interference pattern uh, at the, on the screen which is actually far away from the, uh, from the wall at the distance of L. And uh, I'm interested in the uh, intensity at point P uh, on this screen, okay? So what I'm going to do is to basically repeat what we have done in the previous example. I'm trying to connect one to the P, two P, and the three P. Basically connect the lead uh, to the point of interest on the, on, the, on the screen. And I can actually also uh, uh, denote this angle, this 1p uh, to the uh, horizontal direction. This angle is uh, called the theta uh, in my uh, notation. Then clearly I can go ahead and calculate what will be the uh, optical path length difference between the, the light coming from three number one Three number two and three number three. Okay, and in this case, okay, what I'm interested in is delta one two and uh, delta one three. Right, since the screen is really far away from the wall, therefore I can actually uh, safely assume that these two angles is to be uh, is actually theta because. Uh, the three lines, uh, due to the large distance, uh, this L is actually really, really large. Therefore, they are actually almost parallel to each other, okay? So what is going to happen is that delta one two, which is the uh, uh, phase difference between light from the first lead and second lead, is actually going to be equal to delta one three, which is the phase difference, sorry, uh, it's actually two three, delta two three, okay? It's going to be equal to the phase difference between the second slit and uh, the light from second slit and third slit. And what is actually that number? This number is going to be equal to d sine theta divided by lambda times two pi. It's exactly the same as the what we actually get from the first example. Okay. Therefore, what is going to happen is that. Uh, no matter what theta I choose, okay, the phase difference between nearby slit is actually a constant, which is actually this one. And I will call this uh, phase difference to be delta. I would like to ask you a question now. The question is, how do we choose the delta here such that I have a completely uh, destructive interference. Now I have three vectors. Vector E1, vector E2, and the vector E3. The phase difference between E1, E2, and the E3, the nearby, uh, 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 phase difference is actually delta. 
So the question is, how do I actually completely cancel the electric field so that I have com completely destructive interference? Can somebody help me? Here. The hint is that you can actually use this vector sum idea in a complex brain. Yes, very good. So to, to form a triangle, right, in the complex plane, right? So what we can do is now, now choose the, the phase difference delta to be such that E1, E2, and the E3 actually form a triangle. You see what I mean? Therefore, you can actually already get what would be the, uh, the, the required delta value. The required delta value is going to be 2 pi divided by 3. Right? OK. So very good. So now you are not afraid anymore. So how about four sleep experiment? I just add another sleep. D is actually the distance between the fourth sleep and the third sleep. What would be the, the delta required to have destructive, destructive interference? Anybody can help me? Very good. So if you have four sleep based on this intuition which we, we developed from the complex notation vector sum, what is going to happen is that if you have four slit, the delta will be equal to uh, two pi divided by four. Okay, so what does this tell us? So remember the sine theta, sine theta is telling you the location where you get the minima, okay? So this is actually the power profile or say the intensity profile, okay? And the, this is actually equal to zero, and this is actually delta, okay? The place which you get zero intensity, okay, is actually uh, becoming closer and closer to zero, right? Because sine theta, which is the angle between horizontal direction and uh, this observer P, is proportional to delta. When you have destructive interference at angle which is smaller, smaller, and smaller, that means what? That means the central Gaussian-like uh, uh, structure is going to be becoming narrower and narrower. Does, does, that, uh, does that make sense? Very good. So, so at least we found something interesting now. That means, ha, huh, one idea to get very narrow uh, electromagnetic wave pointing to some direction is to have a huge number of point-like source unslid experiment such that I can actually construct something which is actually very narrow in angle. And I can use that to shoot the object which I would like to detect. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? OK. All right, so that's very good. So now let's actually consider an unsleet interference pattern. OK, so suppose now I have not only one, two, three, and many more until unsleet. All right, I can now go ahead and calculate the E total, which is the total, uh, um, uh, total uh, uh, electric field coming from all the slit we have. Basically, this will be equal to E0. Exponential I omega t minus kr, where I define R1 is roughly uh, capital R, OK? That is actually the contribution from slit number one, OK? And the 
contribution from three, number one is going to be look like we'll be looking like exponential i omega t minus k r minus delta, right? Because there is a phase difference between the, the light from coming from first lead and the second lead, which is actually delta, all right? So what will be the third term? So this is actually coming from three number two. What will be the third term? Exponential i omega t minus k r minus what? Two delta, yeah, because you can see that coming from here, since the distance between three is a constant, which is d, therefore the, uh, the phase difference between uh, nearby slit is actually a constant. Therefore, I, uh, I accumulating the phase difference. Now I get two delta here. And this is actually the contribution from the third slit. And the et cetera, et cetera. And okay, and until the n slit which is actually going to be exponential i omega t minus kr minus n minus 1 delta. And summing all those things together, and all of them are in the z direction. OK? So I'm now going to calculate this summation. So basically, you are getting e0 exponential i omega t minus kr, I can actually factorize uh, this factor out. And what I'm going to get is 1 plus exponential minus i delta plus exponential minus, exponential minus i, 2 delta plus blah, blah, blah. And basically, you will get exponential minus i uh, minus 1 delta in the first term. And the, all those things are pointing to the z direction. And this, I, I know how to uh, actually calculate, right? Just a reminder, basically, if you calculate summation n equal to 0 to n minus 1, r to the n, and this will give you 1 minus r to the n divided by 1 minus r. OK? So basically, I can now go ahead and calculate this, and this will give you uh, basically, um, uh, this will uh, basically give you uh, 1 minus, OK, so r, the, the small r here is actually replaced by exponential minus i delta, right? So therefore, what I'm going to get is 1 minus exponential minus i delta n, right, for the, uh, for the upper part. And then I have ex 1 minus exponential minus i delta in the lower part, OK? So that actually uh, make use of this uh, formula which uh, here, and I can actually simplify this uh, series, all right? As usual, what I'm going to do is to use the trick uh, similar uh, to uh, what I have done there, OK, to actually get a cosine uh, function out of the exponential functions, all right? So what I'm going to do is to factorize out exponential minus i delta m over 2 uh, uh, for the upper part. So basically, I get exponential minus i delta n divided by 2, exponential i delta n divided by 2, minus exponential minus i delta n divided by 2. OK? This is actually divided by exponential minus i delta over 2, exponential i delta over 2, minus exponential minus i delta over 2. Right? The reason I'm doing this is because I would like to actually make this a cosine function. OK? Any questions so far? OK, so if no question, then basically this expression can be, again, rewritten as exponential minus i delta n minus 1 divided by 2, right? Because I have this denominator, denominator exponential i delta n over 2 and the exponential minus i delta divided by 2. 
Okay? Therefore, I can combine them all together and get this expression here. And uh, this is actually exponential minus exponential. Therefore, I'm going to get sine out of it. And basically, I get sine and delta divided by 2 divided by sine delta over 2. OK, so now I can actually go, go ahead and calculate what will be the, the, the resulting intensity. Right? The resulting intensity is going to be proportional to uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the square of the electric field. Right? So basically, the intensity will be proportional to E square, and that is actually equal to E times E star. E and the E is a complex conjugate. And basically, you will see that this will be proportional to um, uh, sine and delta divided by 2 divided by sine delta over 2 squared. Therefore, the intensity will be equal to I0 times sine and delta divided by 2, divided by sine delta over 2, and the square that. Any questions? So after all this work, we have arrived at expression which is very hard to, to understand. <laughs> so what I'm going to do to help you is to really practice uh, the, uh, the, the result as a function of delta on the screen. You can see there are four uh, uh, plots here. The first one is n equal to 3. The upper left one is n equal to 3. So you can see that the pattern looks like this. So at delta equal to 0, surprise nobody, you are going to get maximum, right? Because delta is equal to 0, you are adding n vectors the most efficient way. Therefore, you are going to get the maxima, which is i uh, equal to i0. OK? And uh, if you move away from, from the center, delta equal to 0, and you see that there's a small bump okay, in between, then you continue and continue, and you see that there's another big peak again. You see? So that is actually the structure. If you plot this result, i equal to something proportional to sine square, this uh, expression there. And that is actually uh, what you will get when n is equal to uh, 3. OK? And the, this is actually how I remember this pattern. OK? So when n is equal to 3, you have a family of two adults and one child. <laughs> right? So basically, you have two big peak, and between them, there's a small peak. OK, that's actually how I remember this pattern. And I think it's, it's pretty nice, right? So you can have n equal to 4. It's a bigger family. You have two adults. The adults are slimmer, OK? <laughs> All right. <laughs> because they have a lot of work to do. Uh, then they have two child, All right? n equal to 5, how many, child do, how many ch children do we have? 3. Therefore, the, you know, the adults are really frustrated, so they are even slimmer, OK? In a happy way, OK? Making it positive. And n equal to 6, whoa! Oh my god, I have four children in the family. All right? So there are three, two things which we learn from here. The first one is that. The number of big peak, which I will call it principal maxima, OK? The number of a principal maxima is actually pretty similar, OK, as a function of delta. The, but the number of secondary maxima increase as a function of m value. M value is actually telling you how many slits you have in the experiment. 
And also, you can see that the delta is actually becoming uh, the, 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 the first minima, uh, the delta value is actually decreasing as a function of m value, right? So the, the parents are getting slimmer, all right? So therefore, you can see that if I would like to have a, a radar which is actually pointing to a very specific direction, what is actually the choose choice of m value which you need? Infinity or very large number, okay? For sure, in real life, we cannot do infinity, but uh, now we have found a way to actually design our radar since sine theta is actually proportional to uh, delta. Therefore, what we actually really need to do is to really maximize the number of uh, slits uh, we have so that actually we can create a radar which would really point to uh, the, the direction of the enemy, which is shown there, invading the Earth. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we can actually detect it. Okay, so we will take a five minute break uh, before we actually go to the last part of the, uh, the course, which is the connection to quantum mechanics. So we come back at 35. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome back from the break. Uh, so uh, before we move to the, uh, the connection to uh, quantum uh, mechanics, I would like to talk some more about what we have learned from, uh, from the design of the radar, okay? So this is actually what we actually get. The, the position of the uh, minima, the required uh, uh, um, phase difference, delta, is actually equal to two pi divided by n value, right? Because you are actually, uh, uh, it, with this delta value, the n, n vectors is going to cancel each other, and you are going to form something like a circle if you choose uh, delta equal to 2 pi divided by capital N, okay? And don't forget what is actually delta. The delta is actually d uh, sine uh, theta uh, uh, divided by uh, 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 lambda, right? Okay? and, uh, and uh, um, uh, times 2 pi, okay? Right? So therefore, you can see that the sine, uh, uh, sine theta is actually uh, uh, proportional to uh, lambda divided by n times uh, d, okay? Um, and uh, in this case, you can see that after you, if you increase n value, the resolution or the width of the, uh, the, the, uh, the central principle maxima is going to be decreasing as a function of m value you put in. So in short, how do I actually design a high resolution radar? What I really need is to have lambda uh, to be small, okay? So that means I need to use high frequency uh, uh, electromagnetic wave. I can maximize the m value. I can actually make d very large. That means I'm going to have a very large radar uh, okay, a design, right? Then I can have a very good resolution. Okay, so we are almost done with radar, but the, there's a problem. The problem is that if you look at this, if this is actually the position of the principal minima, okay, you can see that it's always pointing to the center of the radar, right? Where the delta is equal to zero, okay? And uh, then that means I can only scan in one direction. There is a reason why those radar are called phased radar. That is because now I can actually change the relative phase of all those point source emitted from the radar so that I can shift the direction of the central principle maxima. Okay, so what, what is actually done here is like this. So basically, I can have uh, introduced, before uh, emitting the uh, electromagnetic wave, I can introduce a zero additional uh, phase difference. And then for the second one, I introduce additional phase difference of phi, okay? And uh, for the third one, I introduce additional 
phase difference between the third uh, slit emitter, or, or say the third emitter and the first emitter by two delta. And for n's emitter, I introduce a phase difference of n minus one phi. Okay. If I add this phase difference into uh, uh, the setup, what I'm going to get is like this. So basically, delta will become 2 pi divided by lambda d sine theta minus phi angle, right? And this phi is actually the artificial eddy uh, phase difference between those source, okay? And that means I will require, and this will be equal to uh, uh, 2 pi, right? Uh, sorry. This will be equal to uh, pi divided by, 2 pi divided by n, right? Such that you have a completely destructive interference, okay? I can now make this uh, phi to be time dependent. For example, it's increasing as a function of time, pi times t, uh, phi times t, right? Then what is going to happen is that, as a function of time, I'm going to change the d, uh, uh, I'm going to change the uh, sine theta value so that I can get the complete cancellation 2 pi over n, right? So effectively, I'm changing the angle of the central uh, uh, principal maximum, right? By introducing additional artificial phase difference between all those point source, okay? And uh, this is actually the way we can actually rotate the, 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 the place we are scanning uh, up and down and uh, get a very nice uh, uh, result to detect the enemy. Okay, any questions? No? Okay, so now I'm going to move on and discuss a very interesting uh, uh, experiment. So this very exciting experiment contain billiard boards and the two cities. Okay, and we were wondering what is going to happen when those uh, balls basically pass through the slit. Can anybody actually tell me what is going to happen? And what uh, will be the statistics, which I, or say the count, which I am uh, going to get in the receiver uh, uh, layer? Anybody can actually tell me. If I actually shoot a lot of balls through this uh, slit, I, don't be shy, right? It's easy, no? Nobody wants. Yeah, that's right. Right? Doesn't surprise nobody, right? <laughs> you are too, too afraid of answering questions. Okay, so you can see that they make two piles, right? No, right? Okay, very good. So now, this is the exciting part. Now, instead of shooting video boards. Balls, uh, balls, okay? What I'm going to do is to shoot electrons. So I can actually prepare an electron source and heat it up such that it starts to emit electron. And I have two slits and have them uh, pass through the slit and I have a screen which actually have an uh, electron detector to count the number of electrons which I'm going to get on the screen. The reason why I call it single electron source is because each time I control my experiment such that you only emit one electron every time. Okay? The question I'm trying to ask is, well, I see some pattern which is actually like, like video board and they form two piles uh, in the back. That's actually option number one. Or I'm going to see really something crazy. It's the electron is going to be interfere, uh, it's going to do the interference with itself. And that is actually option number two. Okay, the rule of AO3 is that everybody have to choose one, okay? So how many of you think what is going to happen is number one? 
Come on. <laughs> I have only one electron, OK, each time. Nobody thinks so? Wow. Maybe all of you are wrong. <laughs> How about the second option? Hey, some of you actually didn't raise your hand. Come on, come on. OK, everybody. Wow. What is actually happening to your brain? <laughs> My brain is not functional like this. OK, so I really hope that I can bring the experiment to here. But unfortunately, that's actually going to be very difficult. OK, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to show you the experimental result, result as a video. And we are going to see what is going to happen. You see that there are dots popping out. What are those? Those are the detected electrons one by one on screen. OK? So uh, uh, basically, you can see that the number of dots are increasing as a function of time. And I am actually uh, I mean, speeding up things a bit so that actually you can see the pattern quicker. OK, so you can see that there are more and more dots. And each time, you can see that I only get one electron per uh, uh, per emission, right? So you can see now there are more and more and more and more and accumulating more data, like what we actually done in the Large Hadron Collider. We wait there, collect more data. And we are speeding things up. And you can see that, wow, something is actually developing. What is that? Can you see it? Now you are speaking up like 1,000 times faster. You can see what pattern? Interference pattern. What is going on? You are not surprised? Oh my god, what is going on? I am so surprised. Look at this. So I have emission of one electron each time. And that is actually the full snapshot which I took, uh, which actually uh, this experiment, Hitachi Group actually did this experiment. You can actually click on the, this link to learn more detail. And they took four snapshots of the experiment. And you can see that in the beginning, you can see clearly each time you only get one electron out of the, the source. OK? But as a function of time, you are accumulating more and more. And you see that clearly there's a pattern forming, which is actually consistent with what we see in this calculation. OK, so I think that's actually truly amazing. And uh, what does that mean? That means the electron is playing with itself. It's interfering with itself. Right? That's really strange. What is going to happen? What is, what is going on? So one single electron pass through both speed, which is actually the option you choose. Surprise me. And then they interfere like waves and produce the pattern which we see on the screen. That is actually really crazy to me. What is actually even more crazy is this situation. So now if I make measurement in front of the slit, OK? So now I, I put some uh, little uh, device. When the electron pass through one of the slit, I say, send me a signal. OK, so now I can clearly know that which slit the electron is actually going through in the experiment. OK, and the crazy thing is that if I do that, then it becomes uh, two piles. OK, of course, maybe there are some diffraction pattern, but the, it really changed the pattern of the experimental result. And that is actually really very strange. And we are going to uh, talk about that briefly in the uh, next lecture. 
So before the end, I'm going to show you uh, additional demonstration which motivate the discussion uh, what we are going to have in the next lecture. So now I can actually turn off the light again. And also hide the image. Okay, I hope I can find the button. <laughs> All right, so here I have two uh, laser, so I'm going to turn up the, the first laser. And this laser is going to pass through a two-slit, a two-really uh, 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 two, uh, uh, nearby slit, and, uh, and the form uh, interference pattern. As you can see on the wall, I hope you can see, I, I don't know if you can see clearly, that you can see there are many, many dots, nearby dots, which actually shows you the position of the, the principal maximus, right? Because this is actually a two-slit experiment. Therefore, how many children do we have in the family? Zero, right? Because they are, they are okay, they just got married, maybe. <laughs> All right, so, so therefore, you will see only adults, and that is actually the, the, uh, the principal Maximus. You can see many, many nearby dots. They are almost equally bright. Uh, okay, but uh, there's something happening to this pattern as well. And you can see that. Wait, wait, wait a second. In the calculation, we get the the max, the principal maxima should have the same height, right? That means you are going to get exactly the same uh, intensity for all the maxima. But uh, you don't see that here. You can see that if you move away from the center too much, the intensity is decreasing. You see, at the edge, it actually even goes to zero. Right? What is actually happening? Something clearly is actually missing in our calculation. And that, is, that missing part is actually diffraction which we will uh, talk about that in the next lecture. So if you compare this pattern to the second demo, you can see in the right-hand side setup, which I have here, which actually give you a projection on the wall, which is actually lower part of the, the result, okay, of the demo. You can see that uh, this laser actually passed through a single slit but this lead is actually pretty wide, okay? And you can see that indeed, you see the laser coming out, but it's actually not a, not a single spot. And it has some kind of pattern, which is actually popping out there. And this is also related to interference between infinite number of source, okay? And you can see that the, 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 the the pattern seems to really pretty similar to the, the pattern we see uh, in the upper uh, demo, except that the upper demo have individual small structure, which is actually the principal maxima from the two slit interference. And uh, we are going to solve the mystery in the lecture uh, uh, next time. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions related to the lecture today, I will be here to answer your questions. So this is a demo uh, which uh, we would like to show you a single slit and a double slit uh, uh, interference pattern. Okay, so the, the first uh, thing uh, is the setup. So we have uh, a laser beam, which is actually passing through this, uh, this uh, uh, either single slit or double slit uh, uh, screen, and uh, 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 single slit or double slit uh, experiment, and then uh, uh, the laser beam will be uh, uh, going through this and uh, interfere and uh, show interesting pattern on the screen, and uh, uh, there are two setup. The left hand side one is. 
uh, two slit interference experiment, and right hand side is a single slit uh, uh, diffraction uh, experiment. So you can see uh, left hand side one, uh, I already turned it down, the laser beam passed through two slits, and they form complicated, uh, complicated pattern on the screen. And you can see there are two kinds of structure here. The first one is the very fine structure, which you can see that it's like several dots in the, in the, in the, in the center of the pattern. And there are larger uh, 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 scale uh, pattern as well, which you can see uh, that the, the, the overall intensity of all those little dots are also uh, varying as a function of distance with respect to the cent center. Uh, so the, we, during the lecture, we were wondering what actually caused this kind of pattern. And the, the answer is that this is actually coming from the effect of single slit interference. Uh, that, the reason uh, of, uh, why we have this pattern is because uh, the, the two slit is actually not infinitely narrow uh, in, in my setup. Therefore, uh, within uh, a single slit, there's already uh, interference pattern uh, coming out of it. Therefore, uh, the, the compound effect uh, uh, results in a very complicated structure we see on the screen. So to demonstrate this effect, now I'm going to turn on the right-hand side uh, setup. Um, in the right-hand side setup, I, I'm going to have the laser beam, which is emitted from here, pass through a single slit. Uh, which have happened, uh, I actually uh, uh, set it up so that they have the same width uh, between the single slit experiment and the double slit experiment. And you can see uh, after I turn it down, oh, after I turn it down, you can see that now we have two uh, sets of uh, pattern. Uh, uh, the lower set is actually uh, coming from a single slit interference experiment. And you can see very nicely that, uh, uh, first of all, it has a similar pattern like what we see in the double slit experiment. Secondly, you can see that basically we, we carefully tune these two experiments so that uh, the distance between uh, the slit and the screen is roughly the same. Finally, we also set it up, as I mentioned before, such that the width of the individual slit in the double slit and the single slit experiment are the same. And you can see that uh, with single slit experiment, we also see a very uh, similar pattern uh, that uh, you have a central maxima, you have a, a, a high intensity uh, 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 light going uh, toward the central of the uh, uh, going, to, uh, going toward the center of the, the pattern. And the, the intensity actually uh, uh, decreased dramatically, uh, really quickly, uh, as a function of distance. And also, you can see that uh, the pattern actually matches with what you see in the double slit uh, experiment uh, very well. And that is actually uh, pretty remarkable. And uh, from these two uh, 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 experiments, we understand uh, why we have also complicated structure uh, in the double slit uh, experiment, not just like many, many little uh, maximas, many, many little dots, but also you have this uh, overall modulation in the, in the light intensity. And that is actually mainly coming from the single slit uh, diffraction pattern.